Hi guys, it's Miss Sarah from the West Bank Boys and Girls Club, and we're going to be wrapping up the story of the dreadful case of Mr. Jonathan York, the dreadful fate of Mr. Jonathan York. And we're going to see how he ends this up. He's gotten through a lot of scrapes. He's been swallowed. He's almost been eaten. He's almost drowned. He's been caught up with thieves and big Terra Queen pins. So let's see how he gets out of this one. Last we left him, he was back on his barrel and riding it out back to the thieves that kidnapped him. So let's see where we are now. His, his heart thumped widely. The hairs on the back of his neck stood on end and his spine prickled. But this time he was not suffering any symptoms of a panic attack. No, what he was feeling was exhilaration. His victory over the Terra Queen pin had left him with a sense of excitement he had not experienced since early childhood. He was no longer plain old stuttering Mr. York, the man who just a few hours ago was thrown into a tizzy where he could not think of a story to tell. He was different now. He was a bold adventurer. He was a rugged explorer, the sort of character Robert Louis Stevenson would write about. He was the mystery York of his fantasy, and he was a force to be reckoned with. The feeling was so intoxicating, he almost forgot to fear the fear him not, and by the time he remembered, he had safely crossed the shallows to the other side, where the West Bleeport gang was waiting for him. Eel neck and gnar face pulled him from the barrel as helmet had snatched the chest from his arms. The eight legger stabbed the key into the lock and popped the lid, revealing an assortment of coins, rubies, and zirconia necklaces. Blind fingered the loot. Impressive, he grinned. It's not often we account one encounters the Bogomar, the Fearmnot, and the Terra Kingpin in a single night and lives to tell about it. I says we send him to Heckbender, cackled the helmet head thief. Then we'll see how his luck holds out. Mr. York could feel his newfound courage evaporating. Please, you promised to show me a safe place to spend the night. Blom nodded. Aye, a bargain's a bargain. Don't listen to Grumlet. He's ribbing ya. We's honorable types and we attend to keep our promise. Now follow me. The rain had stopped and the clouds had retreated, and above countless stars and planets went the infinite black. For the first time in many years, Mr. York had felt a sense of awe as he gazed into the night. He yearned to stay and let his mind get lost in the universe. The Garface Thief's Blade was behind him, hovering like a wasp, eager to jab him back to reality should he linger. Where are we going? he asked after some time. Northeast, said Blime. Mr. York felt a chill. Northeast? He vaguely remembered, he recalled the old lady at the Kingsbury Inn saying something about unspeakable horror at the swamp's northeastern edge. What's at the... Mr. Blom's head twisted around, cutting Mr. York off mid sentence. You'll see when we get there. The canopy was thinning again, and soon the trees were skeletons, bleached and barkless, looming from up the swamps like rays. The mist re reappeared, though not as it was dry and icy, far from humans, smothering fog of the marsh. At last they stopped. Mr. York could faintly make out a large stone structure in the distance. The keep, the keep of Smoke'em Crow, whispered Blime. The keep was old and lichen encrusted. Blime seized an old iron door knocker and knocked three times fast, three times slow. Its knocks were answered by an old pretty voice. Who goes there? Fence of some blime in the West Bleeport gang. We wish to make your master an offering. The hinges groaned as the door swung open. A misshapen thing draped in rags rambled out. Come in, the West Bleeport gang and guest. We bid welcome. They made their way through a winding passage and up a spiral staircase. Mr. York shoved his hands into his pocket, clenched his fists to keep them from trembling, and tried to ignore the phantom shadows flickering on the walls around him. The stones had assumed a greenish glow, some sort of luminous bacteria, perhaps. They reached the top of the stairs and entered a circular room. Unearthly ornaments sprawled across the floor, and in the room's center stood an altar. Many salutations, said the voice from a darkened corner. 
How good is it to have you in the court of Sin and Crow? Blind Sheet is blade. We come tonight with an offering of the highest soul. Something moved in the corner. Mr. York strained his eyes and thought he could see a spider or a thing crouched in the south of the shadows. How nice I do declare. I so enjoy your offerings, Mr. Blind. Please do not hesitate to show me what you brought. The voice was rich and cheerful. In a different context, Mr. York might have associated it with a big jolly man, the sort of grandfatherly figure one would expect to find carving a holiday turkey. Mr. Blind clapped Mr. York on the, York on the back. This is Mr. York. He might look a mite scrawny and sickly, but don't let his appearance fool you. He's as able-bodied as any of your servants, mayhap, mayhaps more so. Is that true? The thing detached itself from the shadows and took form. It stood very tall, eight feet maybe. Its body was skeletal, mounted on a pair of stick legs, and its arms even longer than the legs called to mind something living under a basement floorboard. It wore a tattered cloak and a mask, presumably a mask, made from the skull of some extinct meat-eating animal. And above the mask perched a hat that split into three ends. From the tear at the hat's rim appeared a pair of burning orange eye sockets. Mr. York! Mr. York! crowed the creature in a rousing southern preacher voice. How pleased I am to shake your hand. One of the creature's limbs shot across the room and seized Mr. York's hand, shaking him with such vigor that the poor Mr. York's whole body bobbled. The grip was cold. Blime's ham jake shoe seemed balmy in comparison. See, said Blime, I knew you two would hit it off. Of course, there's the matter of proper protocol. The creature leaned back and bellowed laughter. Oh, mercy. Where are my manners? He reached under his cloak and tossed Mr. Blime a small leather bag. Mr. York turned to the thieves, his face a caricature of desperation. You're selling me to this demon after all I did for you? Are you just a pack of slimy double-crossing bad guys? Mr. Blime threw his arms up defensively. What business is this, dear York? calling his hurtful names after we does you the biggest favor of your life. My, my, you came to us looking for shelter, and that's what we've given you. You'll be safe from rain and things and swampy beasts. And not only do you get a permanent home, but a promising career as well. Working with Simio Crow is one of the most respected necromancers in the world. If nothing else, you owe us a thank you kindly. That Blime spun around and drifted back down the stairs. Mr. York was left alone with semi Crow. Mr. York tried to hide the fear in his voice. What are you going to do to me? Drink my blood? semi Crow clapped his hands and laughed again. Oh, heavens, Mr. York, you slay me. Of course I'm not gonna drink your blood. We're partners now. You're part of the semi Crow family. You mean, you're making me your slave? Simon Crow stopped laughing. If you want to put it into harsher words. Mr. York crossed his arms. What if I refuse to serve you? Oh, uh, you will, like all others. You will. They come in dragging their heels, cussing up a cyclone. But all that changes after they've been zombified. Zombified? Yes, indeed. Once you've been zombified, all those anxieties and nasty feelings will wash away like a snow in a springtime shower. Mr. York had spent his life avoiding unpleasant, yet he knew what a zombie was. A mindless, soulless minion to evil. Well, maybe I don't want to be zombified. Simi Crow's voice became soft and gentle, a parent reassuring an upset child. Now, Mr. York, let's think of this, let's think this through. For truly, 
This is a big decision. You're a mild fellow, am I right? Yes, of course you are. You're not the sort of person who's cut out for his own adventures. No, you dread that sort of thing, and you dread risk. Risk is bad for routine. Mr. York fidgeted. So why, so why worry about the whole mess? Your emotions, your free will, they only complicate an otherwise safe and secure existence. Shed them, surrender them to me. Now I'll make all the hard decisions for you. You'll never have to fear getting lost in, in a swamp again. Doesn't that sound appealing? Mr. York shrugged. He felt numb. I thought it might. Now come. Simic Crow led Mr. York to the altar and handed him a goblet filled with bubbling broth. One sip. That's all. One sip. And all your uncertainty and anxiety will disappear. This nightmare will be over. Mr. York brought the goblet to his lips. He froze. What are you waiting for? Go on. The goblet teetered in his hand and then he lowered it. He looked at the simming crow directly in his burning orange eye sockets. I'm sorry, but I can't let myself be zombified. What do you mean? What about your anxiety, your fear of the unknown. Simi Crow's voice had dropped to a whisper. One sip will eliminate those forever. Yes, that might be nice, but I'd also lose my freedom. Freedom is overrated. With freedom comes uncertainty. You hate uncertainty. You hate adventures. Adventures are bad. Maybe, or maybe adventures make you better. They build you. You're delusional, Mr. York. You'll doom yourself to a lifetime of reckless wanderings and pitfalls. The same sort of thing you've experienced this very night. Perhaps, but perhaps that's better than a bland, pointless life. The life of a man with no story. Drink, drink the broth, Mr. York. Simi Crow's voice had de devolved into a hoarse whisper hiss. Mr. York swallowed his fear and stood firm. No, and if you excuse me, I'll be on my way. Simi Crow screeched and lunged at Mr. York. Drink! Mr. York leaped back and hurled the goblet at his tormentor, and Simi Crow recoiled with a shriek. Mr. York paused for a split second to marvel at his own bravery, and then he turned and fled before the fiend had come after him. He flew down the spiral staircase, ignoring the howls and screams around him. He scampered past the gatekeeper, kicked open the doors, and dashed into the outside mist. The West Bleeport gang had stopped a short distance from the keep to divide their pay. The helmet-headed thief was first to spot the escapee. He sounded the alarm with a war cry that could decimate porcelain and charge, his mace cycling through the air. Miss York dodged the blow and the villain slipped and toppled over from the weight of his own weapon. The other thieves jumped to attention and drew their blades. Garface and Eelnick rushed at Mr. York as one. Mr. York stepped nimbly aside, and the thieves crashed into each other and collapsed into a heap. The eight-legger scrambled forward, only to trip over Helmet Head's mace and skitter into a mud patch. Now the only obstacle between Mr. York and his freedom was blind. The thief chieftain twirled his blade and flashed his dagger to smile. Now, where is you running off to in such a hurry? Mr. York weaved to the left. Lime foresaw the mover and blocked his path. He lashed out his blade, intent on beheading Mr. York. Mr. York was sh saved by sheer accident. The eight leg legger, still struggling with himself, clawed Mr. York's ankle with a stray limb. Mr. York blundled, blundered forward, unintentionally ducking Blime's blade and ramming his attacker in the chest. Blime was bowled over and he more of a face, it may have revealed a dumbfounded expression. 
Mr. York regained his balance, took off, and though not before aiming a sharp kick at Blind. He missed his target of the dagger too small, but managed to cap- catch the thief hard in the ribs. Blime dropped his blade and crumpled like a withered leaf, affording Mr. York the chance to escape the swamp's undergrowth. He ran down with his head He ran with his head down to keep branches from gouging his eyes. He ignored the West Beatport gang's curses, which soon faded in the distance. Brambles and picklers tore his clothes and claws to skin. Vines and roots snatched at his body and groped his ankles. He paid them no heed. The only thought on his mind was putting more distance between himself and the Northeast Edge. He splashed through the swamp, oblivious to mud splattered on his body with each footfall. He leapfrogged over boulders, zigzagged through thickets, and hurled hurtled across sink pits. He moved with grace and speed he never would have thought himself capable of achieving. For how long he ran, he couldn't say. 15 minutes, 20, an hour? The time was a blur. His survival instincts had hijacked his brain and conscious thought was non-existent. His feet struck solid ground, glancing down. He saw he's back on a path. He raced along the trail, arms pumping like loose puppet limbs. Finally, he looked and saw a light through the trees. At first, he figured his crazed mind was playing tricks. But no, the light was too steady to be an illusion. He gritted his teeth, gave one last spurt of speed, and burst from the swamp. There sat the Cankerberry Inn, forlorn as ever. He sprinted across the clearing and pounded on the door. No answer. Hello, he yelled. He pounded again, still no answer. With his remaining strength, he threw his fist against the door and screamed at the top of his lungs. It's me, Jonathan York, let me in, please, I beg you. At last came a familiar shuffling and sound. The door creaked and there stood the old man. He was wearing pajamas and his eyes were red and even squintier than before. Lower your voice, you rabble wrestler. I heard you the first time. He adjusted his spectacles and raised his lantern. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Sir. Mr. said Mr. York. I apologize for not having a story earlier, but please, I must stay with you until daylight. You cannot imagine the horror I've been through. The old man scratched his chin, wiped his nose, and waved Mr. York inside. We'll discuss it in the kitchen. Mr. York followed the old man to the dining table. They sat at opposite sides. Mr. York began to tell the old man all that had happened since he left the Kankberry Inn. He told of his wanderings through half rock swamps in the charlatan of Percival Trellis. He told of the Whistle Tree and the vile Bleak Court gang and their evil leader, Fantismo Blonde. He told of the treasure hunt, his encounter with the Bogglemire, his brush with Fearum Knot, his battle with the Terra Queen Pen. He told of the sinister necromancer, Semi Crow, and how he was nearly zombified. He told of his escape and his mad dash through the swamp lane. And then finally, Mr. York had nothing more to tell. Yes, it was horrible while it lasted. But now it's over. You be telling the story the rest of your life. Telling your children to your grandchildren, and if you're lucky enough, your great-grandchildren. The time will take many things from you. It may take your health, your loved ones, your worldly possessions. But no matter what, you'll always have your story. As long as you tell it, it will live on and on, said the old man. Mr. York chewed his lip in what may or may not have been earnest compilation contemplation very well he said at last i see your point may i have your key may i have my key now the old man smiled and handed the key to mr york first door on the right sleep well mr york you've earned it mr york rolls from the table and staggered down the hall he jostled open the door to his room and flopped into the bed the spring squealed and the seats were musty and he wondered if all the early excitement would keep him from rest but his eyes turned to lead the moment his head hit the pillow. His thoughts scrambled and Mr. York slipped into a deep, dreamless sleep. He woke late the next morning with throbbing muscles and revolting taste in his mouth. He downed a quick breakfast of eggs and toast offered by the old lady and then was on his way. He saw no sign of the hooded woman, the lanky man, or the odd fellow. But perhaps that was best. A pristine blue sky greeted him as he walked out on the path. The air was brisk and not at all human like the day before. The first hint that summer was closing and fall was ready to debut. The swamps would be much less menacing in daylight, cheerful even, with soothing green vegetation and glassy water. 
Cicadas trilled in the trees above, and in the distance a bullfrog chugged a rum. Monsieur Arc kept to the trails, and the movement of walking seemed to calm his aches in his legs. By late afternoon, Mr. York had reached Springshire, and from there it was only half hour until he was home in Brockleport. That evening, he savored his clean clothes and a hot dinner. Mr. York made a solemn vow to never tell what had transpired during that dreadful night in Half Rock Swamp. This, of course, was one vow Mr. Jonathan York failed to keep. And that's the dreadful story of the dreadful fate of Mr. Jonathan York. So I'm glad you really enjoyed it with us. I know some of it was a little crazy, but I hope that you learned that stepping outside your door may be a little scary, but you can learn a lot, become much more courageous in the end. All right, guys, y'all have a good week and I'll see you next time.